Knowing that pursuit would be close, Sasuke had insisted to the Sound 4 that they should head out immediately, and that he'd explain his extra companion on the way. They hadn't questioned him. Hinata had to admit, for subordinates of Orochimaru, they had been surprisingly accommodating. A bit freaky, what with one of them having six arms and another with two heads, but friendly enough. You've got nothing to worry about, Missy. You are not our target today, but that mark on your shoulder is invitation enough. I'm sure our lord will welcome you, Sakon said. And I've got to say, that stuff with the Hyuga curse seal is just hilarious. For all the Leaf likes to portray itself as the nice ninja village, those fuckers are obviously as messed up as the rest of us. Tayuya laughed. Language. Jiroba tried to lecture, causing an argument between him and Tayuya, which Hinata suspected was a regular occurrence between those two. Say, Sakon, do you think Orochimaru will give us an extra reward for bringing her? Kidumaru asked. He'll definitely be pleased with us, that you'll be rewarded enough. Sakon responded, and then he called a halt. Sasuke looked irritated. If we don't hurry, the only reward you'll receive is a sure death. I've told you, pursuit will be close. Be that as it may, we've got our orders, Sakon said. And then he proceeded to explain the second stage of the curse mark and what would be required for it to be accessible. And since I'm in a really good mood, we'll give one to you as well. And he presented one of the awakening pills to Hinata. I promise you, once you have this power, you'll never need to feel helpless again. Hinata took the pill and stared at it for what felt like a long time. To not be helpless, to not be weak, to not lose. That had been her goal at the start, hadn't it? Even before she had become a genie. And yet... What kind of victory had she found through strength not her own? She had crushed Neji with the Hyuga Curse Seal. Then she had crushed Sakura with Orochimaru's Curse Mark. What had those victories garnered her in the end beyond more doubt and self-loathing? Hinata let the Awakening Pill fall from her hand towards the ground and then crushed it beneath her heel. And just like that, whatever goodwill the Sound 4 had had for her disappeared. Hinata found herself pushed against the tree by Tayuya. The taller girl held her forearm pressed against Hinata's neck to the point where Hinata had trouble breathing. You would spurn Lord Orochimaru's greatest gift? You some kind of spy? Hinata found that the other three members of the Sound 4 were also looking at her with cold expressions. I'll find no joy through such power. Hinata wheezed out, but just seemed to enrage Sayuya more. She increased the pressure for a second, but then Sasuke grabbed her arm and pulled her away from Hinata. Enough! She says she doesn't want it, and that's the end of it. It's no big deal. And what of you, Sasuke-sama? Sakon asked. Oh, I'm not nearly so picky. I just need your word that this temporary death state is indeed temporary. You have it. Just swallow that pill, and when next you open your eyes, you'll be a changed man. Sasuke nodded, tossed his ninja tools to Hinata, and then looked from her to the Sound 4. When I wake up, know that any injury she has sustained I will pass on to all of you tenfold. None of the Sound 4 looked happy with that. You proclaimed me your new lever. Was that just idle words? Sasuke pressed. No. Sakon said. Then I order you to keep her safe, understand? We... understand. Sakon said reluctantly. Sasuke waited until he got verbal confirmation from all of the Sound 4 before swallowing the pill. When Sasuke was safely locked inside of his box, Tayuya again felt safe to direct her hostility towards Hinata, though she refrained from any physical violence this time. So, you're the new boss's bitch, huh? She spat. Just thinking of all the preferential treatment you'll be receiving makes me sick. There is nothing we can do about it, Sakon said. Now let's go. Sakura acknowledged that Shikamaru was a very smart cookie, and she'd welcome any of his advice, she really did. But he needed to accept that she was in charge, and he wasn't. Kiba in the front is a good idea, but shouldn't you go second? That way you could easily give orders. 
In the heat of battle, I won't have time to give orders, and I'm not familiar enough with you, Choji, and especially Sai's abilities to think I'd know what you should do better than you yourself. The plan Sakura had chosen for the squad was to place Kiba at the front, since he was the only one who could follow the trail. Choji and Naraka were flanking him. Then, she chose to leave a bit of empty space with Sakura, Shikamaru and Sai trailing a good distance behind them. It looked like they were actually two groups, with a front row and a back row. The reason was simple. Kiba and Choji were close-range frontline fighters. Nargo could do all ranges, but she was probably their most powerful combatant, period. Sai claimed his preference was long-range combat, which was also Sakura's preference. And Shikamaru was mid-range. If they encountered trouble, the close-range fighters and Nargo could bulldoze ahead, while Sakura, Sai and Shikamaru would try to hide and strike from a distance, hopefully with the element of surprise. If not, they would provide range support. It was a very simplistic plan that left a lot up to the individuals. But she suspected that trying to micromanage their team when she was so unfamiliar with half of them was an excellent way of getting them all killed. In the beginning, Sakura had held out hope that Sasuke and Hinata really had just decided to elope together. Because, well... It was Sasuke. Sakura herself had entertained fantasies of eloping with the pretty boy. But as soon as Kiba noticed four other sense accompanying their wayward comrades, Sakura knew it wasn't so, and that they were very unlikely to get through this without having to fight anybody. I find your reasoning somewhat curious, Sai said, still with that fake smile that Sakura was already starting to hate. You openly acknowledge that Narako there is our most versatile and powerful member. Then maybe she should be calling the shots instead of you. Hell no! Sakura is way smarter than me! Naruko protested from the front row. If being smart is the issue, then you should all just listen to Chikamaru, Choji said. Alright, enough, enough! Shikamaru said. I'm sorry, I shouldn't question you, Sakura. It just. this mission is really personal for me. We'll get them back, I promise, Sakura said, and that seemed to be enough for Shikamaru. They kept pursuing their target, with Kiba being able to inform them that they were steadily gaining on them, until suddenly... STOP! Sai screamed, causing everyone to do exactly that. When they all looked at him, they found him pointing at a paper seal. An area of effect explosive trap seal, Shikamaru observed. If Sai had noticed it a moment later, Kiba, Choji and Noriko would have been caught inside of it. He clicked his tongue. They know they are being pursued. Maybe Hinata told them, Narako suggested. If she's not their prisoner, but a willing companion, she'd see us coming. Hinata wouldn't want to harm us, Shikamaru protested angrily. I hope that's true, I really do, Sakura said. But regardless, this mission just got even more dangerous. Maybe I should be at the front after all, Sai suggested, and Sakura was grateful that that fake smile of his was absent. It seemed he was capable of being professional when it was serious. I can be quite observant, though we'd have to travel a bit slower from now on. Placing traps generally takes more time than avoiding them, so that shouldn't be a problem, Shikamaru said. But they'd know that too, Sakura said. Which means that their goal here isn't to outpace us, but just to kill us and then be on their way. Sakura grimaced. I really, really hope Hinata and Sasuke aren't willing participants here. Regardless, we need to make a decision, Shikamaru said while looking at Sakura. Well? Sakura hesitated. If Sai claimed he was a good enough ninja to spot traps, she'd believe him. But that would place him at the front, which wasn't where he was best, at least according to him. And the ones who were best at the front clearly weren't the most observant. Kiba tended to rely a bit too strongly on his sense of smell, so that anything he couldn't smell tended to go unnoticed. She didn't know Choji well enough to make any judgments there. And Narako? Well... 
During practice, ever since she learned Winjutsus, her response to any obstacle course involving traps was to just blow it all aside. But even Nagato didn't have the stamina to just keep destroying the forest in front of them for hours at a time. But... She might be able to do something similar. Nagato, could you make one of those new clones of yours and have it rush ahead? Everyone looked on with confusion as they'd never seen Nagato rely on any form of clones before. Ah, you want to trigger all the traps with clones. Yes, but if you're on low on chakra, tell me immediately. We can't have you exhausting yourself before we even engage the enemy. Understood. And she made a shadow clone. And then that shadow clone made another five copies of itself. To explain, if you make a clone and have that clone make five more clones, then you've still only cut your own chakra in half, while the clones now have a little over 8% of what you started with. Math, everyone! This is probably unnecessary since this is Narako, but she's still being cautious with the technique. So, our job is to be fodder to lure out the enemy's attacks. One of the clones said nervously, and a few of them even gulped. Alright. And then they were off. I wonder what it's like to be a clone. The original Narako said, looking disturbed. I mean... They theoretically have my personality, and I know I wouldn't enjoy being disposable cannon father. None of them had any comforting words to give her. Almost immediately afterwards, they could all hear explosions in the distance as the clones did their job and died valiantly to the sound force traps. Well, if they didn't already know we were coming, they do now, Sai said cheerfully. Hinata dearly regretted telling the Sound 4 that they were being pursued. She had done that in the hopes that they'd increase their pace and try to outrun them. Instead, the Sound 4 had unilaterally decided that they were just going to kill them instead, and seemed quite excited at the prospect. Considering that the pursuers in question were most of her old classmates, including Shikamaru, that placed her in a very awkward position. If they fought, and Shikamaru and the others got their way, she and Sasuke would be dragged back to the village to whatever fate awaited them there, which he doubted would go well for them. And if the Sound 4 had their way, then Hinata would be partially responsible for the deaths of most of her friends. So yeah, an awkward position to say the least. Hinata nearly had a heart attack earlier when she saw someone with Nariko's look and chakra be blown to bits, but thankfully it had turned out to be a simple chakra construct. When had she even learned how to do that? I have to admit, I do like their style. Kidomaru said with a chuckle as they heard another explosion rocketing the forest. Hinata, again, being the observant one, first noticed how the real pursuit team was getting within striking range. And also how some Genjutsu butterflies were sneaking up behind them. Hinata felt paralyzed by indecision. She felt that if she opened her mouth, that would finally be the last straw where she would declare herself an enemy of Shikamaru and the others. Time passed, and her hesitation became its own choice. The butterflies made contact, and a second later her maybe-maybe-not comrades descended on the field. The Genjutsu gave Narako just enough time to ensnare all of the Sound 4 with their hair. By the time they noticed they broke out of the Genjutsu, they were already trapped. I wouldn't move if I were you. I can make my hair sharper than any blade. Narako warned. Hinata, I'm so relieved you're okay. Shikamaru beamed at her. Is Sasuke in that box over there? Hinata figured that since Shikamaru must have known she had seen their approach, the fact that she hadn't warned anyone meant she was on their side. Honestly, Hinata herself wasn't sure whose side she was on. He is, Hinata answered. I knew we couldn't trust you, Tayuya said. As if she'd ever work with the likes of you, Shikamaru taunted. Come on, let's go, Hinata. This is it. If I do nothing, it's over. She'd be returned to Konoha, to her clan. More than that, she felt like she was betraying Sasuke as he'd be dragged back to Konoha too. Knowing Sasuke, he just tried to get away again, and Hinata knew that would never be tolerated. They'd break him before he bends to their will, Hinata thought. 
Hinata started to walk towards the Leaf Ninja, who all seemed relieved at how easy this had gone. When Hinata was about halfway there, however, she burst into motion. And before anyone could react, she struck at Nadako's hair with a gentle fist and severed it. As soon as she did so, the bindings around the Sound 4 fell away. Hinata quickly jumped back to put the Sound 4 between her and her no longer comrades. She needn't have bothered to be so hasty. All of them had been too dumbstruck to respond. I've got to admit, you had me worried there, Sakon said to her. Still the boss's bitch, but at least you ain't a traitor, Tayuya said. Oh, how wrong you are. Hinata thought while untying her leaf headband. Why? Chikamaru shouted at her. It's tradition, isn't it? Hinata said, deliberately misinterpreting the question. She took a kunai and scratched a deep line on her headband through the leaf symbol before tying it back around her neck. To wear a villager's headband is to publicly announce one's allegiance. To wear that same headband but with the villager's symbol scratched through? Well, you could imagine what that symbolized. Please, Shikamaru. If you ever cared about me or Sasuke, please, just let us go. Like hell will I ever accept this! Shikamaru shouted, and at the same time the Sound 4 all shot into action. All of them hurling kunai with explosive attacks close to the Leaf Ninja. Though not directly at the Leaf Ninja, since those explosions were merely meant to keep them corralled in place, which gave Jiroba enough time to create a dome of earth around the pursuit team. Which should be familiar to you if you know the original story. You people go on ahead, I've got this, Jirobo said. All of the Sound 4 accepted this easily, and they went on their way, Hinata included. No enemy has ever escaped from Jirobo once he had them trapped in there, Sakon informed her, and he had a slight mocking smile. I hope you don't have any lingering affections for those Leaf Ninja because you'll never see them again. I hope so, Hinata said, and she meant it. She hoped that after they had escaped, her old friends wouldn't pursue them further and simply go home. That they would escape, she didn't doubt. All her old classmates had jumped into the clearing once Naruko had had sound for trapped. But Hinata knew there was still a sixth person, one she didn't know, who had decided to remain hidden. Shirobo's jutsu looked hard to get out of from the inside, but with outside help it shouldn't be impossible. Where the hell is Sai? Sakura thought. They had been stuck in the dome for over a minute already, and there was still no sign of the man. This stone dome was draining their chakra, so their time was short. Of course, Nariko's reserves were so huge she almost didn't feel it, but Sakura sure as hell did. Having lost patience, Kiba and Choji had tried to brute force their way out, but with no success. The walls just repaired themselves as fast as they could damage them. A scream came from outside and Sakura nearly wept with relief. The next time Choji tried to attack the wall, it shattered and they were all free. Chirobo looked as if a wild animal had tried to jump him from behind. Sai! Sakura screamed, and he appeared from out of the trees. Is something wrong, Haruno-san? Sai asked. What the heck took you so long? I merely wish to ensure that the others had left. That way we now have a chance to attack this one isolated from his teammates. That brought Sakura up short. That was indeed a very good reason. I am also curious. Why ask me to leave my cover and come into the open? And why did you all jump into the clearing when it was agreed the Long Range group was to remain hidden? Again, Sakura was brought up short. When Narko had captured the enemy, they'd all just figured it was over. When Sai posed the question now, Sakura realized they had all been a bit dumb. Some squad leader I am, Sakura thought. Never mind that, Sakura said. Let's just focus on the enemy in front of us. Sai's fake smile showed that he well knew that Sakura was just dodging his question, but didn't argue the point further, and instead said, 
Might I suggest that one of us keep this one occupied? If we waste too much time here, Hinata and Sasuke might cross the border and we will fail the mission. Like I'd let any of you escape. Jirobo yelled and then proceeded to hurl a rock the size of a small hill at them, with Choji countered with his human boulder. Pretty much like in canon. And so too will Choji volunteer. Though he admittedly isn't quite as eager, since Jirobo hasn't told Sulto Chikamaru for being a bad leader, because, well, he isn't the leader. Sakura, however, makes a different call here than Shikamaru did in her place. We fight him as a team, she decided. Then we might lose Hinata and Sasuke, Shikamaru protested. If he's powerful enough that even when we're all working together, we can't beat him quickly, then he is too strong for anyone here to survive in a one-on-one -on -one fight against him. Hinata and Sasuke are important, Shikamaru, but our lives matter too. And while I'm in charge, none of us will ever fight these guys unless we outnumber them. Shikamaru didn't like it, but he did reluctantly accept her decision as squad leader. A leader should be willing to make sacrifices for the mission, Sai said. And what? Should I just keep sacrificing my teammates to get closer to Hinata and Sasuke? Why not? Sai asked. Even if four of us die, that still leaves two to subdue Hyuga-san, and Uchiha-san seems indisposed inside of that box, the mission would then be a success. Even Shikamaru, who had been for leaving a single person to fight, looked at Sai in askance at that logic. Why are you all looking at me like that? Sai asked, seeming honestly confused. Well, if you were to ask my opinion, which admittedly nobody ever does, Jirobo said with a bit of humor, I prefer Pinky's plan. This would be boring for me otherwise. Sakura, Sai and Shikamaru returned to the original plan and disappeared into the trees. Choji and Kiba went to engage Robo in melee, and Narako was only a step behind them. Kiba and Akamaru came from his right with their fang over fang, and Choji tried to tackle him with the human boulder from the left. Jirobo was able to kick Choji away as if he was a giant football, and simultaneously slapped Kiba's and Akamaru's attacks to the sides. This did keep all of his limbs occupied, however, so Nariko's kick to his face landed. It almost felt like she had tried to kick a brick wall, except she knew she could crack a brick wall with one of her kicks. Jirobo grabbed her leg and sent her hurling into a nearby tree. Nariko was able to land against the tree with her feet towards the trunk and immediately jumped back into the fray. Kiba was also already back for round 2, but this time instead of attacking him head on, he threw a smoke bomb at Jirobo. This was Nariko's clue to send her hair into the smoke and try to catch him, but her hair found no purchase. Nariko, who had recently fought someone who also relied heavily on Earth Jutsus, knew what came next and shouted, Watch the ground! Which allowed Kiba to jump away once Jirobo tried to grab him from beneath. And by that time, Nariko had already finished making a familiar sequence of hand signs and launched her cutting great breakthrough at him. Without even making any hand signs, Jirobo someone was able to raise a slab of rock out of the earth to hide behind, just by kicking the ground really hard. He's a master of earth nature transformation, Nariko realized. The slab of rock Jirobo had used to hide behind was then launched at her like a projectile. A very large projectile that she only barely managed to jump over. Joji came in for another round with his human boulder, but it had the exact same result as last time. We need to coordinate our attacks as a team or else we'll never get anywhere, Nariko thought. She looked and found Kiba waiting to the side, waiting until she was ready. They had trained as a team, they knew how to work together. Joji... Joji would just have to be a quick learner. They saw their chance when they saw a weird white animal looking thing trying to sneak up on Jirobo from behind. Sai had explained enough about what he could do for them to realize that this thing was on their side. Kiba and Nariko again tried to attack Jirobo from two different directions. Jirobo, in response, jumped a small distance and when he landed he created a shockwave of moving earth on the ground and both destroyed Sai's ink beasts as well as caused Nariko and Kiba to lose their balance. Nariko then had to roll away as another giant boulder was thrown in her direction. Choji again came in, but this time something seemed different about him. When Jirobo tried to kick him away, Choji halted his rotation to try for a more conventional punch. 
His attack landed, but Jirobo was able to punch him in the stomach in turn. Amazingly, this actually caused Jirobo to be sent flying and not Choji. Now, Naruko knew that Choji could hit hard, but not that hard. At first, it seemed Jirobo's punch to the stomach had done some damage to Choji as well, as he had a pain expression. But somehow, Naruko felt like his pain didn't come from that punch. Anyway, being understandably distracted from being sent flying, Jirobo didn't notice one of Sakura's genjutsu images making contact with him. Naruko charged forward recklessly with a kunai out, which he infused to the best of her ability with wind nature transformation. The genjutsu proved its effectiveness when Jirobo tried to parry a non-existent attack, leaving him wide open. She slashed at his neck, hoping to inflict lethal damage and managed to draw blood. Jirobo's neck was incredibly thick though, and Jirobo was already moving for another attack, which coincidentally allowed him to partially dodge the kunai. Both of those things combined saved his life. He was still bleeding heavily though. Genjutsu! Jirobo spat out blood. I fucking love Genjutsu! And then markings began to appear all over his skin, and the bleeding from his neck lessened considerably. And in case you are wondering, Jirobo's hatred of Genjutsu is me extrapolating from the difficult relationship between him and Tayuya, which Canon hinted at. Choji tried to come in for another attack, but whatever strength advantage he had somehow gained had been reversed, as Jirobo was able to send him flying with a punch again. Kiba! Nariko yelled out. I hate to say this, but I don't think we can safely melee this guy anymore. Not that we ever could, Nariko added in her head. Kiba grimaced, but Choji understood. Shuriken and Throne Kunai were the order of the day now as they tried to attack him from a distance. Thankfully, Jirobo didn't outclass them in speed as thoroughly as he did in strength, so keeping their distance was well within their abilities. Shikamaru occasionally tried to create an opening by catching Jirobo in his shadow position, but Jirobo's physical strength was so great it allowed him to mostly just ignore the technique. The idea of taking this guy out in a timely manner was looking more and more unrealistic by the minute. Jirobo also mostly ignored Kiba, Narko, and eventually also Choji's attempts to attack him from a distance as he started to rampage through the forest, knocking over trees in the process like they were made out of thin cotton. Come out of hiding, you cheap trash! He bellowed. It seemed Jirobo really, really didn't like Genjutsu. Nariko, being a lot more familiar with Sakura, spotted her before Jirobo did, and tried to disappear into the woods to join her when Sakura singled for her. You've got a plan? Nariko asked. Sakura nodded and explained. After they had been able to combine their talents in order to pull off the Rasengan, the two girls had wondered in what other ways they could combine their talents, and had thus experimented a little on their way back to Konoha. Naruko and Sakura's hands interconnected, and together they made two handstand combinations in sequence. First for the Shadow Clone Jutsu, then the one Sakura used for her illusions. Naruko provided the chakra and will to make the clone, and Sakura meanwhile attached her genjutsu to them like she previously always did with her incorporeal clones. The clone then transformed to look like Sakura and appeared in the clearing shouting, Here I am! Jirobo next proved that he had a monochrome of intelligence by not falling for the obvious trap. He probably didn't understand the exact nature of the trap, but he understood that it was one. So instead of charging at it, like they had wanted him to, he instead tried to destroy the clone by hurling huge boulders at it. The clone dodged admirably, and if you were at all familiar with Sakura, you'd have known that this wasn't her, since she wouldn't been able to dodge half as well. As the target refused to come to her, the clone tried to attack it instead, but Jirobo knocked the clone aside with a tree that he uprooted and then used as a club. Since no bodily contact was made, no genjutsu. Damn it, I need an opening, Nariko said. Sakura nodded and tried to send more genjutsu images at Jirobo, but it was a lot harder now that he was on the lookout for them. Sakura needed a way for her genjutsu to land. To that end, she studied their opponents and noticed that he most often dealt with any shuriken thrown his way by slapping them aside with his hands. If she could somehow attach a genjutsu to a shuriken, would he bother to dodge it? Well, as Jiroba had proven he wasn't a complete idiot, he probably wouldn't allow it to make contact if Sakura just came out in the open and threw it herself. 
to have to disguise the attack as something regular and harmless. So instead, Sakura had Nariko create another clone with the Genjutsu attached, and then that clone transformed into a regular looking shuriken. Nariko again joined the fray. She at first threw some regular normal shuriken to establish a pattern, and when she confirmed that yes, the projectiles at least made contact, she used the special Genjutsu one. The plan worked. In the opportunity that it provided, Nariko was able to wrap Jirobo in her hair. Same deal as last time, Nariko said. I can make my hair sharper than any blade, so I wouldn't move if I were you. Jirobo struggled against his bindings, but her chakra laced hair held firm. No one has ever been able to break my hair before, Nariko bragged. Surrender. Then, Jirobo's skin started to turn red. Like I'd ever lose to the likes of you! He bellowed and entered his second stage curse mark and again began to struggle against his bindings. Nariko made a hand sign, not for any special jutsu, but just to help her focus more and more chakra into her hair. Despite all that, she found her hair straining against this monstrous strength. She was already adding wind chakra to the mix, but Jirobo seemed willing to cut his own skin apart in order to break free. Normally, someone wouldn't have been able to do this without killing themselves, but Jirobo's skin seemed a lot harder in this new monstrous form. Someone quick, I can't hold him much longer! Nariko yelled. They had had trouble with him before. There was no telling what he could do now if he broke free. Sai was the first to answer her prayers as he jumped on Jirobo's shoulder and stabbed the syringe into his neck, right at the spot Naraka had cut before with a kunai. It must have contained some kind of drug as Jirobo started to wobble in place and then collapsed on the ground, his curse mark receding again. Kiba and Choji had to sit down and take a moment to rest. Sai went to seal Jirobo into a scroll, and yes, I do think his Fujitsu is good enough to do something like this. Though Kagi will want someone to interrogate, he said. Now, the big question here is, did they lose too much time here? To that I say that the Pursuit team did get sent a lot sooner after Sasuke than in canon. Because Hinata was so high profile, her absence was noticed almost immediately. So they do have a bit more wiggle room here as far as time is concerned. Of course, I also think Sasuke left in more of a hurry here. And that difference in timing also made the sound for Miss that team of returning Jonin that they encountered. But I think the first point counts for more. Not to mention that in the anime, Shikamaru chose to actually wait a bit before attacking until the sun came up so his shadow jutsus would actually work. This was after Jirobo and Kirumaru were both already dealt with. This also implies that they had a bit of extra time. This point is, admittedly, mostly from the anime, but even in the manga they also show a day-night cycle going by during the pursuit, so I think it counts. But to elaborate a bit more on Sasuke leaving sooner and missing the returning team of Jonin. This means that him arriving in time for Orochimaru to immediately turn him into his next vessel is more of a possibility here. Now back to the story. Shikamaru was slightly pale at this point. It had nothing to do with any exhaustion or some such. But because he imagined what would likely have happened if Choji had to fight this guy by himself. Whatever happened with Hinata and Sasuke, he decided he wasn't going to argue with Sakura anymore with her nobody fights these guys solo strategy. This guy is probably a good indication of what to expect from the other enemies, Shikamaru said. We have to assume that they can all transform like that. If they do, our chances of survival will go down considerably. So we have to beat them before they use it, Sakura said. Shikamaru nodded. That he didn't use it earlier probably means it has some drawbacks. Still, we can't let them feel pressured enough that they feel the need to use that form. We need to kill them suddenly, in one strike, without leaving any chance of recovery. Easier said than done, Naruko said. Ending a fight in one surprise attack tends to be the default strategy anyway, so I don't see how this changes anything. Anyway, we can't stay here to rest like guys want us to. We have to start a chase again or we'll lose them, Sakura said. Nobody argued with her on that. 
Choji also handed some soldier pills around to get everyone back into fighting shape. On the way though, Narako raised the point of Choji's surprise strength, and he explained how his free colored pills work, and that they all had their drawbacks. He had eaten the green spinach one, so he still had the yellow curry one, and the red chili one. And what is the drawback for the red one? Narako asked. It took some prodding, but eventually Choji told her. Choji, Sakura said, as your squad leader, I hereby forbid you from ever using that pill. We'll call off the mission before we resort to that. Shikamaru looked conflicted at that admission, but Sakura ignored him. I'm fine with risking our lives, but there is a difference between that and doing something you know will kill you. I hope we can hold true to that method. I really do, Choji said, sounding more serious than they had ever seen him. But I don't care what you say, Sakura. If I have to take that pill to save all the rest of you guys, I will. Sakura was tempted to just order Choji to hand over the red pill to her, but decided against it. As squad leader, she'd simply have to make sure Choji was never put into that position. Now, because of the extra time they took beating Jirobo, it takes them much longer to catch back up to the rest of the Sound 4, and they are already getting too close to the border for their comfort. They don't bother to use the same trick that they used in canon by transforming into Jirobo and try a fast one, because by now they had to face the fact that Hinata was against them, and she'd be able to see through that in an instant. Any kind of surprise attacks were also impossible with her, so they just charged straight at them. Upon being notified of this by Hinata, the Sound 4 take them a lot more seriously than they did in canon, and let me explain why. In the original, Every single member of the Sound 4 seemed under the impression that they could solo the whole Pursuit team by themselves. And nothing really ever contradicted that belief until very late in the game. That the Cannon Pursuit team, minus one, managed to catch back up so soon told them that they likely left the member behind to distract Jirobo while the rest of them charged on ahead. This didn't tell them anything about how the fight with Jirobo actually went. This time though, since it took so much longer, and all of the Leaf Ninja are still there, it's obvious that they all stay behind to fight Jirobo. More than that, that they beat him. They may have all seen Jirobo as their weakest member, but they are all still somewhere around the same tier of power. And they now have proof that the Pursuit team, while together, can at least best the weakest of them without taking losses. So from here on, thinking that they can all just no diff the whole team by themselves isn't going to cut it anymore. I hate to make this call, but we should all stay here and figure out just how tough these guys are before deciding on a plan. Sakon said. Overkill, was all Tayuya said to that. We won't all stick around unless they are all really strong. I just want to get a feel of them and see just how many of us it would take, and who would be best suited. Are you sure? Kidomaru asked. Lord Ruchimaru wants Sasuke as fast as possible. He won't be pleased with us if we are delayed because you want to play it safe. Sakon grimaced. Hence why I hate making this call. And next he addressed Hinata. You just hang back and prevent them from taking Sasuke in case any sneak past us. Understood. Hinata said. Why couldn't they have just stayed away? Hinata thought bitterly. The first actual glimpse of the pursuit team the Sound foresaw was Naruko jumping into the air and making the hand signs for the great breakthrough. Now, let's talk about Naruko's Winjutsus because I feel I might have been underselling them, since they never did anything to any serious foe she faced before now. The thing is though, that this Winjutsu can be made on a level with the Winjutsu that Tamari used to one-shot second stage Sayuya. When looking at just her ninjutsu and nothing else, Nariko can be considered Joni level, or very close to that, and that has been the case since the start of the Chunin exams. I don't think this is exaggerating since her massive chakra reserves and somewhat decent control means she can use an almost spam high power ninjutsu for a very long time. But Gara had a shield of sand, Jirobo and Kabuto could make earth walls as cover, and Tsunade is a sunny that could literally pull up a part of the street to use as a shield. With her casual spars with Sasuke, his fire jutsus just became stronger when faced with her wind jutsus. They all had some way to counter her jutsu. But that's the thing. 
Not all of the Sound 4 have a way to deal with this. Jirobo was actually the most suited to fighting Naruko out of all of them. Tayuya, we know, doesn't have an answer. The best Kidomaru can do is to shield himself in that weird, organic, metal-like substance. Sakon can summon the Rashimon Gate, which is exactly what he does here, and it's large enough to shield Tayuya and Kidomaru as well. Naruko actually keeps up the pressure of the Jutsu for an extended time, forcing the Sound Ninja to keep behind cover. I've got this, Kidomaru says, and shields his body in that protective layer I just mentioned, allowing him to peek out behind the cover without getting torn to shreds. He makes a bow and shoots a high-speed arrow at Nariko. As she sees it coming and Kidomaru's aim is a little off due to the wind blowing in his eyes, Nariko is fine, but she still needs to hold her wind jutsu. Sakon rushes forward next to see whether this girl's taijutsu was as high level as her ninjutsu. He swiftly realizes that it isn't. She wasn't bad, but nothing he couldn't handle. Even when Choji and Kiba jumped in to engage in a 3 vs 1 taijutsu fight, Sakon could easily hold his own, as Udon simply grew more limbs to deal with the attacks from multiple directions. Sakon saw his teammate signal him and he disengaged, letting Tayuya's Doki summons engage the enemy instead. These summons weren't quite as good at close range as he was, but that wasn't the point. The point was that the summons were expendable and replaceable. So when Kidomaru shot a white web to catch all the combatants, it didn't matter that the summons got caught up in it too. Tayua simply released her summons and she could summon them back later if she needed them. Choji, Kiba and Narko all tried to break free of the web, but ordinary physical strength wasn't going to cut it here. What did work was Narko's wind nature transformation enhanced kunai, which was how she managed to free them all. It took some time, but Sai was able to buy her enough of that by harassing the enemy with his ink beasts. I see now, Sakon said with a grin. That girl is obviously their most powerful member. Once we take her out, the others will be easy prey. You mind if I take her then? Kidomaru asked eagerly. If she's the only one that has an answer to your webs, it would be best if you take all the small fry instead. If possible, I should be the one to face her, Sakon said. While this made sound technical sense, it also allowed Sakon to brag that he'd killed the best one. Regardless, I don't think we need all three of us. Tayuya! He yelled. You go on ahead with Hinata, we'll handle this. Understood, she said, and she and Hinata were off, along with the box containing Sasuke. Now, as much as Sakura didn't want to split her team up, the simple fact was that if this fight took anywhere near as long as the last one, they'd lose Sasuke and Hinata. No ifs and or buts about it. And now they were facing two enemies instead of just one, so believing they could end this faster than before was unreasonably optimistic. There were six of them and three opposing them, not counting Hinata. So even if they split up, they'd still be able to keep a 2 to 1 ratio. Kiba! Shikamaru! Half of them! Sakura ordered. She had to send Kiba, since he was the best at tracking a running foe, and Shikamaru was the best at delaying actions, which was the point. Also, out of everyone there, he was the best suited to talk sense into Hinata and also Sasuke if he got out of that box. She couldn't send Narako, since Sakura too realized he needed her to deal with Kidomaru's webs. Choji, Sakura wasn't sure would be able to delay Tayuya. Sakura couldn't go, since she needed to stay with Nariko. While Sakura could operate on her own, she knew that more so than any other combination, the team of Nariko and Sakura was a lot more than the sum of its parts. And that was ignoring the sentimental reasons for why Sakura wanted to keep Nariko close. And Sai? Well, Sakura didn't have much more than a gut instinct to go on here, but she got the impression that he was one of their best combatants after Nariko. And Sakura's whole plan was to win here and then catch up to Shikamaru and Kiba. Sakon and Kidomaru tried to stop Kiba and Shikamaru from giving chase, but Nariko was able to provide covering fire with her winjutsus, and they were forced to take shelter again. Interestingly, they took shelter behind the Rashomon gate that they summoned before, instead of just making a new one. This told her that summoning that thing did take a significant chakra cost, or they could just only summon the one period. Considering what Sakura knew of summoning jutsus, she guessed and also hoped it was the latter. Kidomaru again pokes his head out of cover, and this time fires another giant web at Nariko. Her wind wasn't quite cutting enough to sever those threats, 
only her melee, wind nature infused attacks were. So she had to pause to defend herself again. This allowed Sakong to once again charge at Nariko, only was even faster now as he had entered his first stage curse mark. Choji and Sai tried to assist, but Kidomaru shot another web, forming a sort of net between the trees, blocking their path. You'll be dealing with me, the web user yelled, and charged at Choji and Sai. He too was using first stage curse mark. Now, we don't know much about how good Kidomaru is at close quarters combat, only that it's not as good as Neji, which really doesn't tell us a lot. I'm guessing he's at least competent, and he can make his webs really fast, which he uses here both defensively to block against Sai's Tanto, which if you don't know is a kind of long knife that he uses. And to be clear, when I say use webs defensively, I mean he covers his skin in that weird armor he has. And he uses his webs offensively by shooting the material out of his mouth and sticking Choji's arms to a tree. Sai was a bit more skilled at evading the webs, but he too seemed to be having trouble, and was too busy trying to not get hit to counterattack. Nariko, meanwhile, was trying to play the long-ranged game by mostly using her hair to keep Sakon at bay, while also trying to shoot off her cutting winds. The key word here being trying. Sakon was fast enough to slip past her hair and keep interrupting Nariko's usage of hand signs. Sakura, meanwhile, was hiding behind a tree, mostly just observing the flow of battle and looking for an opening. Nariko, even though she was fighting solo against Sakon, was doing a lot better than Sai and Choji against Kidomaru. Actually, it was just Sai against Kidomaru, since Choji couldn't get free. At this rate, Kidomaru would win, and then 2v1 Nariko with Sakon. Sakura knew that Nariko was better suited to fight Kidomaru, but they clearly knew that too. Nariko, leave a clone and disengage, go help the others. A clone won't survive for long, Nariko said as she came out of a roll from when she was sent flying by one of Sakon's kicks. I'll help it, you just go win and hurry back, Sakura said, throwing a kunai with an explosive tech to buy Nariko enough time to make the clone and leave. Sakon didn't try to stop them though, and once the real Nariko left, he spoke. I know what you're planning, but Kidomaru won't lose that easily, and now I have at least one of you all to myself. So let's not waste time, shall we? If you pop, don't rush back, just trust that I can survive for long enough, Sakura told the clone, earning a nod of acknowledgement. It only just occurred to Sakura that she had just essentially broken her own rule of nobody ever fighting solo. Well, she had Nariko's clone assisting her, but she understood just how fragile that thing was. So did Sakon as he charged at it. Nariko's clone held out her hand, and together with Sakura's help, they formed the Rasengan. Sakon's charge wasn't nearly as reckless as Kabuto's had been though, as he simply paused his advance, jumped back, and observed carefully. What follows was an excellent example for why one should practice Ujutsu extensively before using it in combat, as Nariko and Sakura now discovered a flaw in their cooperation Jutsu. First, Sakura couldn't hold the technique for long, at least not when they tried to make it as big as possible, which they had done. The second problem was a direct result of the first. Since they couldn't hold it for long, and their opponent wasn't stupid enough to run into it, they had to come to him. Nariko tried to do exactly that, but due to the massive discrepancy in how fast Nariko was in comparison to how fast Sakura was, Sakura fell behind and thus lost contact with Rasenga. Without her help, it exploded in their faces, causing Nariko's clone to pop. Sakon burst out in hysterical laughter. I admit, having an opponent defeat themselves like that is a first. Sakura had enough presence of mind to use the explosion as cover to try and hide in the forest. To compensate for her rather limited physical abilities, and knowing that surprise would always be her best weapon, Sakura's most practiced skill after Genjutsu was her stealth and evasion tactics. She just hoped it would be enough. Let the hunt begin, Sakon said and gave chase. When the real Nariko received the knowledge about her clone popping, it took every ounce of her discipline not to rush back immediately. Yes, she, or rather her clone, had agreed that Nariko wouldn't rush back once the clone fell. But she also suspected that Sakura hadn't expected for that to happen like 3 seconds into the battle. 
When she arrived at the clash between Sai and Kidumaru, Narako was tempted to just blast them with a surprise wind blast. But with Sai and Kidumaru engaged in melee combat, there was no way to avoid friendly fire. Instead, what she chose to do in the time before Kidumaru noticed her was to cut Choji free. We have to end this quick! Sakura's fighting alone! She told him. Upon noticing her, Kidumaru at first looked worried. Don't tell me she got the better of Sakon! He first thought. But upon hearing her words to Choji, he grinned. By all means, you're welcome to join us. Sai, get out of the way! Narako yelled as she began to make the hand signs for the great breakthrough. Sai did try to do exactly that, but Kidomaru moved with Sai, keeping him between himself and Narako. Narako was eventually forced to let the chakra she had built up fizzle out. Not willing to hurt your friends to get at me, are you? Kidomaru taunted. I don't have time for this! Narako thought. Sakura needed her! Narako charged forward, but Kidumaru didn't seem inclined to want to engage. Kidumaru followed a very simple strategy. His opponent wanted to end the fight quickly, so he dragged this out instead. He let loose a smoke bomb and disappeared into the trees. But let's see who's really the best long-range fighter, shall we? Narako hastily formed a cutting grey breakthrough and shredded a small part of the forest. She was willing to just assume she had gotten him and returned to Sakura. But after she had taken just two steps, Sai tackled her towards the ground and a giant arrow missed her by inches. You're getting too emotional and it's making you lose focus, Sai said as he held her back on her feet. He's trying to hide and snipe us from the trees, Nariko said, ignoring his comment. Obviously, Sai said. Well then, Nariko said and again started to make hand signs. Cutting great breakthrough! She fired at a random chunk of the forest. She didn't let up on the jutsu and continued to mow down trees. Fighting someone who was trying to hide was never her strong suit, but she was more than willing to level this entire forest if that's what it took to kill this bastard, so she could return to Sakura. Her relentless destruction did flush the enemy out of hiding. Ha! <laughs> you really are something else, you know that? Kidomaru said. When he appeared, he again decided to keep one of her teammates between him and her. Only this time it was Choji. Come, girly. I won't try to hide this time, I promise. Nariko did exactly that and charged, and Sai followed suit. Choji, meanwhile, wasn't happy to be used as a human shield and tried to run Kidomaru over with his human boulder. Kidomaru was able to dodge without issue, but still, if Nariko just waited for Choji to attack and move himself out of the way, she'd now have a clear shot at Kidomaru with her wind jutsu. Instead, she was rushing right into close quarters. I really am losing my cool, Nariko thought. Trying to correct her mistake, she tried to jump away. Kidomaru responded to that by spitting one of his webs at her. Nariko could cut the webs, but not quite as fast as Neji would have been able to do. And Kidomaru now proved she couldn't cut them faster than he could make them. Especially when Kidomaru was this close and could aim them where they would cause her the most inconvenience which were her arms. No! Sakura counted on me to beat this guy! Nariko fought desperately, as more and more of her movements got restricted. Despite her best efforts, Nariko eventually became immobilized by being cocooned inside the webs. Next, she was sent flying into the air until she hung upside down. From her position, she could see that Sai had also been pinned by the webs. Like a spider, Kidomaru climbed from the threads that hung Nariko into the air. He climbed over her cocoon until his face was just inches from hers, and she could smell his breath. So you were supposed to be the best of them, huh? I bet they're all counting on you to come and save them. I wonder what they'll think when I present them with your severed head instead. Sakura! I need to get to Sakura! Nariko fought as she continued to struggle futilely against her bindings. Kidumaru leered at her. Yes, little insect. Struggle! This is always the best part. Next, Nariko saw several spiders crawling down from the trees towards her. I want your head as a trophy, but the rest of you can serve as a meal for my little summons. Nariko tried to scream, but her mouth was covered by the webs, so all that came out were muffled sounds. And all that she thought was, 
I can't die here! Sakura! Sakura! She was abruptly sent flying again, but this time it felt like something had grabbed her. multi size Jutsu! What the- was all Kidumaru had time to say before he was ripped from her cocoon by another oversized hand. Kidumaru tried to use webs to anchor himself to the trees, but the trees themselves were being uprooted. Kidumaru was slammed onto the ground and then a hill-sized Choji fell on him. Choji held Naruko up in the air to prevent him from accidentally squashing her as well. Choji again slung back to his normal size and then began ripping Naruko's bindings apart. Whatever strength they held, it seemed Choji was currently able to overcome it. As for Kidomaru, nothing remained of him except a red stain on the ground. A bit of gold was mixed in, showing that he had tried to defend himself with his little protective shell. But a shell that hard and that close to the skin was more suited to protect you from piercing and cutting damage, and not this kind of massive bludgeoning damage. Before you ask, I only took the yellow pill, Choji told her. At that moment, Narko could have kissed him. That performance was pathetic, Sai told her. How are you one of Kona's most talented youth? Choji pointed at Sai. You, shut up. Narako had never heard him sound so angry. Now, Choji let loose a pained groan as the side effects of the pill started to settle in, and Choji let himself slump against the tree. Narako, I do believe you've got a friend to save. Choji, you can't possibly know. Narako didn't even have the words to explain, though it seemed Choji did. What's it like to have a friend who means so much that trying to think of the time before seems to cause you physical pain? And the thought of losing him makes it so you lose all ability to think clearly? Choji smiled wryly. Oh, I think I know a bit. Now go. Narko didn't need to be told twice. She cut Sai loose and then began searching. Sakura told Narako to come find her once they had taken out the web user, but the pink-haired girl quickly realized the flaw in that logic. Sakura was trying to hide from Sako, and if she was hiding well enough that he couldn't find her, then chances were Narako or any of her other friends couldn't either. Because of that, Sakura chose to stay relatively close to the other battlefields, since chances were Sakura was going to have to go to them instead of they finding her. She had been very lucky earlier that Narako's attempt at flushing out Kidomaru by cutting down the trees hadn't also destroyed her own hiding spot. Sakura! She heard Narako yell. Thank goodness, Sakura thought. Still, she had to be careful here and set up some preparations. I'm here! Sakura yelled. Narako's face lit up and she started to run towards her. Sakura threw a kunai in her path forcing her to halt. Sakura? On the day after we became friends, you got into a fight with some of our classmates. What was the reason for it? Narako's face lost her happy demeanor. Well, at least I got you to reveal your position. And her transformation got lifted and Sakon charged at her. Sakura jumped back and Sakon followed. She doubted she could get away now that they had a visual on her again, but that wasn't her plan here. When Sakon stepped on the branch that Sakura had vacated, his feet passed one of several little genjutsu images that Sakura had camouflaged as little twigs. Sakon was better at her in taijutsu in any way imaginable. Durability, speed, skill, strength, you name it. However, as she had demonstrated against Rock Lee in the preliminaries of the Chunin exams, all of that could be overcome if you can catch your enemy in a genjutsu without them noticing. Sakura carefully studied Sakon's eyes and where they were looking. When he was looking at something that wasn't there, she knew she had him. Sakura rushed forwards, intending to slash at his neck and end it with one strike. When she went to slash at him, however, a new body grew out of Sakon and grabbed her arm. The thing with genjutsu like that is, is that it affects the brain, but we happen to have two of those. A hand went to grab her face and Sakura's head was subsequently slammed into a tree trunk. Repeatedly. She tried to loosen his grip on her, but he was simply too strong for her. A knee impacted her stomach and Sakura coughed up blood. 
Stuck on release her head, only to then grab her shirt, lift her from her feet and then press her hard against the tree. I'm curious about something, so mind if we ask a question? Sakura didn't answer immediately, as her head was still spinning. A hand grew out of Sakon's shoulder and slapped Sakura's face. We're speaking to you. Sakura groaned. Got to buy time. Keep them talking somehow. She thought. What? What is it? You're pretty damn weak, Sakon said. That a question? Sakura responded, causing the same hand from before to slap her again. The question is, why are you in charge? Sakon asked. I... I don't get it, Sakura responded honestly. Me neither, hence the question. I, I guess I'm just smarter than the rest, Sakura said. Then she remembered that Shikamaru existed, but before she could amend her statement, Sakon spoke while waving her answer away. Yeah, I get that, but why would they follow any command you give them when they are so much stronger than you? Sakura let that question sink in, and despite the fact that he was probably going to kill her, she couldn't help but pity the boy in front of her. What kind of life must he, or well, they have had, that the very idea of anything besides the weak following the strong was this alien to them? Sakon scowled and started to exert more pressure against her chest. Bad look. Are you looking down on me? And he punched her in the face, causing Sakura to spit out blood again. Then Sakon jumped back, dragging Sakura with him. Let. Her. Go. There was no way Sakura would ever mistake Naruko's voice, and at that time, she thought it was the most beautiful sound she'd ever heard. Sakura tried to blink the blurriness from her eyes. It seemed Sai was there as well, but Choji wasn't. Well, now that you've said that, of course I'm not letting her go, Sakon said, and promptly entered his second stage curse mark. But since there's a chance you got Kidomaru, I guess I shouldn't play around. And what happened next would be yet more fuel for Sakura's nightmares, and quite frankly, Narako's as well. Sakura's body, clothes and all, began to melt into Sakon's demonic-looking body. Her stomach and torso were completely absorbed, and only her lower arms, hands, feet and head were still visible. And if you're calling bullshit on me, saying no, Sakon and Udon can't do this, I won't say you're wrong. I am taking creative liberties, but this does fall into the same category of Sakon's abilities, so I think it fits. Her life and ours are now connected. Do keep that in mind when you're attacking us, will you? Sakon said. And then the duality that was Sakon and Udon attacked. Narko was clearly at a loss of what to do, and fell back in full defense, clearly unwilling to risk harming Sakura. Sai though... Sai was another matter. He tried to slash at Sakon with his tanto. To Sakura, Sakon's skin felt like a viscous liquid as Sakura felt herself being shoved around and used as a human shield against Sai's attacks. Damn it, Sai! What do you think you're doing?! Naruko screamed when Sai's blade cut into Sakura's shoulder. Sai sounded exasperated. Shinobi rule number 23. In combat, any comrade who is taken hostage should be considered already dead. Sakura didn't bother to listen to Naruko's angry reply. She had to do something, as it was clear Naruko had no clue what to do, and Sakura knew Naruko would never risk harming her. Sakura still had the usage of her hands, so she could still make hand signs and mold chakra. She doubted she could catch Sakon or Udon of guard with her normal genjutsu. First of all, they would be on the lookout for anything out of the ordinary and so were likely to spot her images as she created them. And they had two sets of eyes to spot them with. Second, she'd have to catch them both at the same time without either of them noticing. However, as disturbing as her current position might be, Sakura figured there was a chance she could turn it to her advantage. As Sakura's body was melded to... whatever this demonic looking creature might be, this meant that her chakra network was closely connected to its. What better medium to transfer a genjutsu could one ask for? Sakura tried to surreptitiously make a single hand sign. 
As she was taking such a direct way to transfer her chakra, she only needed the one. Still, this was Genjutsu in a way that she normally didn't use. Normally, she pre-programmed an illusion to have a specific effect. Now, she was trying to directly link her own imagination to her enemy's brain. Two brains, actually. However, as theoretically easier this was compared to a normal technique, Sakura was still essentially trying to invent a whole new technique on the fly. So she'd need absolute focus and had no room for error. Sakura closed her eyes and visualized the scene she wanted to show Sakam and Udon. The mission comes before all, Sai said, and threw a kunai that embedded itself right into Sakura's forehead. Naruto screamed in horror and rushed forwards, not to attack Sakon, but simply to reach Sakura, futile though it was. Sakon and Udon laughed. This part would be tricky for Sakura. Since Sakon and Udon's own behavior was part of the Genjutsu, it had to be something they wouldn't find odd. From what little Sakura had seen of them, they were sadistic enough to find this whole situation worthy of mockery. Sakon punched Nariko's chest, sending her flying. Again, Sakura hoped this was close enough to his natural fighting instinct that neither Udon or Sakon would notice anything off about the waking dream they were in. As a dead Sakura had no value to them, Udon and Sakon would allow Sakura to fall out of her body. And again, Sakura could only guess that this was something they'd find no fault in. For all she knew, they would routinely absorb their dead victims in some twisted form of cannibalism. Slowly, Sakura felt herself glide out of Sakon and Udon. The real Nariko and Sai soon realized what was happening and were ready. The moment Sakura completely separated from the Sound Ninja and the Genjutsu broke, they each pierced the duality with their respective weapons. Sakon and Udon died with a mixed expression of confusion and pain on their faces. Nariko gingerly moved Sakura into a sitting position. I did it, Sakura said, and again coughed up some blood. I don't care what anyone else says, Sakura. You're much stronger than me, and always have been, Nariko told her. Can you stand? I... I don't think so, Sakura said, and next she found herself bridal carried by Nariko. The web guy is dead. Toja's alive, but he's suffering from the after effects of the yellow pill. But that just leaves one. I'm sure Sai Shikamaru, Kiba, and me can handle one. So I'll send a clone to take you home. No! I'm squad leader. I can still cast Genjutsus, and I need. I wanna see this through. Nariko hesitated, but then gave her a watery smile. So, so much stronger than I. Back with Hinata, two of them are in pursuit. Hinata informed Tayuya. We won't be able to outpace them at this rate. Huh, so they are willing to split up after all, Tayuya mused. Lord Orochimara won't be happy with the delay. Please, just let me try and talk to them, Hinata asked. One of them is my old teammate. I might be able to convince him to just let us go. Nobody else needs to get hurt. A little late for that kind of talk, don't you think? By now, half your old friends might be dead. In any case, if we talk and it doesn't work and we fight anyway, then we'll have wasted even more time. I'm not risking my hide just to assuage your guilty conscience. Hinata gritted her teeth and her hands balled into fists. Then do you want me to just go on ahead? Still worried about fighting your old comrades, are you? Tayuya taunted. Would you even know the way? In any case, Shasuke sama ordered us to watch over you, and I can't do that if you're on your own. Just keep making sure they don't run off with Sasuke, and warn me of any tricks they might pull with those freaky eyes of yours. Tayuya sobbed, summoned her doggies, and pressed her flute to her lips. Do you by any chance enjoy music? Kind of? Kind of. What kind of answer is that? Anyway, try to enjoy this, because not many people get to hear this melody without a great deal of pain. Then, Shikamaru and Kiba appeared. Hinata, stop! Let's just talk! You at least owe me an explanation! Shikamaru yelled. Less talking, more dying! 
Tayuya set and started playing her music, and Hidoki summons attacked, forcing Kiba and Shikamaru to dodge and attempt to hide. Shit, those are big, Shikamaru says. Could be a problem. Meh, Kiba says. Me and Akamaru could take them. Shikamaru raised an eyebrow. No, really, I could. I've got this awesome new jutsu. The thing is, though, we have to mark the target first, and we can only use it twice a day. So I'd rather not waste it on our summons if possible. You need an opening. I'll see what I can do. Okay, for this fight I initially wanted to skip most of it, since we know how Shikamaru deals with Tayuya. But the more I thought about it, the more points I had to address because Shikamaru has a definite ally here in the form of Kiba, and Tayuya has a sort of maybe kinda of vaguely on her side ally in Hinata. The first change in the canon fight is after Shikamaru, and now also Kiba, try to hide from the summons. In canon, Shikamaru needed to hide for a while to catch his breath and to gather his thoughts to formulate his strategy. However, in this case, Ayuya can simply ask Hinata where they are hiding. Now, Hinata is still trying to juggle wanting her and Sasuke to get away, while also not wanting any of the rescue team to die, and that's especially true for Shikamaru. So Hinata doesn't really want to take any initiative to screw them over. But she also can't exactly refuse when Tayuya flat out asks her. This, in turn, forces Kiba and Akamaru to go out into the open to draw Tayuya's attention and give Shikamaru the time he needs to come up with a plan. But that's not really that big of an issue, since if Shikamaru can avoid the Doki summons for at least a little while, then Kiba, who I see as way more physically capable than Shikamaru, can definitely stay alive for a decent amount of time if staying alive is all he has to do. And if Shikamaru can observe Tayuya as she sends the Doki summons after Kiba, that would make identifying their movements based on Tayuya's fingers on her flute a lot easier. This allows him to catch the Doki summons in a shadow possession jutsu just like he did in the original. Tayuya can, of course, just remove her summons from the battlefield. And here Hinata's presence is again relevant since she'd see Shikamaru try and catch Tayuya in the shadow possession directly afterwards. Behind you! She'd yell. And so Tayuya isn't caught by the shadow possession and she jumps away. Hinata doesn't want Shikamaru to die, but considering the circumstances, she also doesn't want him to just win. Again, it's a really difficult position for Hinata to be in. However, because the summons are at least temporarily gone, Akamaru at this point can jump out and hit Tayuya with his dog spit. In case you've forgotten, the dog spit is necessary because Kiba can see where he is going while performing his strongest jutsu, and he needs that scent marker. Ah, that's this. Disgusting! Tayuya said. I'd surrender if I were you, Kiba says. Heh, <laughs> you do know I can just summon them back, right? And Tayuya proceeds to do exactly that. Very well then, Kiba says, and then he and Akamaru transform into the two-headed wolf. Now, I might be making a huge mistake here, but I'm going to try to power scale a little. As this next jutsu by Kiba, to me, seems just a little ridiculous for a Genin to have. This thing's fang over fang was able to nearly smash through a Rashimon gate, Orochimaru's strongest defensive jutsu. If that doesn't sound impressive, then I will remind you that it took three of these things to save Orochimaru's life from a tailed beast bomb fired from four tailed cloak Naruto. I'm not saying Kiba's attack is anywhere near that level of crazy, but I am willing to claim that this attack is at least as strong as the Chidori, and that might even be lowballing it. And no, that doesn't mean Kiba has more attack power than Sasuke, since not all Chidoris are created equal. But still. I mean, this thing cut Sakon and Uron in half, and only his very unique circumstances allowed for that to not be instantly fatal. Like, I'm an amateur when it comes to scaling like this, so I might just be speaking nonsense, and if I am, I'm sorry. But this story is basically fanfiction anyway, so yeah, just go with it. I'll say that by throwing our summons into the attack and entering second stage curse mark just before the point of impact, Tayuya doesn't die instantly. But that's really the most I'm willing to give her, and that's me being generous. After she gets hit by Kiba, she's sent flying through several trees and is barely capable of standing. And suddenly, Hinata found herself without nominal allies. Hinata jumped down to help Tayuya upright, but it was clear she was going to need some time to recover. Then, things got worse for her as Sai, Narako, and Sakura appeared. 
Even Choji stumbled into the clearing a few seconds later. Sakura looked as if she could barely stand without help, but that hardly mattered. Tayuya looked at the rescue team in horror. She realized that their presence likely meant that she is now the last member of the Sound 4 left standing, while the Leaf team still had all of their members. Please, Hinata, we're not out to hurt you. I'm trying to save you, Shikamaru says. Upon hearing those words, Tayuya, in desperation, grabs Hinata from behind and points her flute at Hinata's throat. Back away. If you're trying to save her, just leave us alone. If not, she dies. Please, everyone, just calm down. Just let me try to explain, Hinata says. If you think you can talk them into leaving, do it! Tayuya hisses to her. I wanted to talk from the start. I should have, Hinata says. I fled because of my family. They wished to brand me with a curse seal, and... And that's what's going to happen to me if you force me to return. And so you decide to join Orochimaru? Shikamaru asked. That was Sasuke's idea. He was already planning to leave when I came to him. So I left with him. And what was his reason? Hinata felt a knot forming in her stomach. She could see that her reason for leaving invoked some sympathy from the rescue team, Sainada included. Sasuke's reason, however... He feels he needs to kill his brother, and needs power to do it, Orochimaru offered. But that went over about as well as Hinata had expected. That's... bad, Hinata. Sasuke's reason. I can't accept that. Only he gets to decide where his reasons are good enough, Hinata says. But Shikamaru, are you really fine with just handing me back over to the Hyuga clan? And that was ignoring the fact that Tayuya would likely kill her before letting the Leaf Ninja quote-unquote rescue her. Shikamaru took a few seconds to search for an answer. I wouldn't let them harm you. I'm well connected. We Naras might be considered lazy in most cases, but we look after our friends. I could get my clan to give you shelter, and the Yamanaka and Akimichi would likely help too. It wouldn't matter. Keeping their hold on the Byakugan is something my clan would cheerfully start a civil war over. I don't want that. I just want to get away. Please, just let us go. Shikamaru looked at Sakura, but she said, She's your teammate, as is Sasuke. I'm leaving this up to you. Sai looked flabbergasted. But... but the mission! Sai... shut up. That's an order, Sakura says. Don't forget that getting her back safely isn't really an option, Tayuya says, and presses her flute into Inato's neck, drawing a bit of blood. Yes, this flute is sharp enough to stab someone to death with. Why? Because ninjas, moving on. Shikamaru looked frozen with indecision, and attention held for nearly half a minute, before everyone was startled by a small explosion. Where before Sasuke's box had stood, now stood Sasuke. And just like in canon, when he first emerges, he's in his second stage curse mark state. Akamaru whimpers inside of Kiba's jacket. The curse mark slowly recedes, and Sasuke looks at his own hands in awe. Then he looks towards the sky, breathes in, and by the look of bliss and satisfaction on his face, you'd think he was having some kind of religious experience. Sasuke! What the hell, man? Shikamaru shouts. Sasuke ignores him and observes his surroundings until his eyes fall on Tayuya, holding her flute to Hinata's neck. Tayuya's eyes widen and she begins to shout, Wait! But halfway during her shout, Sasuke disappears from everyone's view for a moment, and in the next moment, Tayuya's severed head impacts the ground. A moment later, the rest of her body follows. Sasuke? Hinata says hesitantly. Sakon had claimed that the next time Sasuke opened his eyes, he'd be a changed man. Hinata feared what that meant. The curse mark had only mostly receded. It still covered a part of his eyes, which were now an unnerving form of yellow. Hinata would be lying if she said Sasuke didn't frighten her at that moment. Are you still you? I'm still me. I'm just... Please, this all. 
I know now that I've made the right decision. Sasuke finally bought us to give any attention to Shikamaru and the others. I've already tried to explain things to them, Hinata says. Sasuke shrugs. Then there's no reason to linger. Come, Hinata. And then he starts to walk away. What? Just like that? Naruko shouts. Sasuke stops and cranes his neck and smirks. Unless you'd care to try and stop me. Before Naruko could jump at him, Kiba shouts, Don't! Naruko gives him a questioning look, and he just shakes his head. Naruko next looks at Chikamaru. Are you really fine with an ending like this? I don't know! Curses, I don't know! Shikamaru says. He was especially unsure about Hinata. Given what he now knew, he just couldn't really blame her. Heck, if the faction she was joining was anything but Orochimaru's, even a rival village, Shikamaru would have likely aided her escape. And Sasuke? Right now he questioned whether he had ever really known him. The choice to continue the mission became even more difficult as yet another person descended on the field. An older boy with white hair and two red dots on his face. He interposed himself between Sasuke and the retrieval team. Kimimaro had come to make sure there were no more delays. Do not waste your time here, Kimimaro says to Sasuke. You must hurry. Our master is running out of time. I, Kimimaro, will deal with these vermin. Sasuke nods and starts running. Hinata follows only a moment afterwards. Are we really letting them just go like that? Naruko asks of Sakura. Sakura bites her nail in worry and thinks out loud. We'd have to split up again. And we can't do that! Kiba says with a grimace. Kiba? Sakura asks. You know that Akamaru and I have a talent for assessing our opponent's threat level, right? And this new guy? Akamaru hasn't been this shaken since Gara. And Sasuke is the same. It's why I stopped Naruko from engaging. Everyone looked at Sakura to see what call she'd make, even Shikamaru. Sakura thinks frantically. The only way to have a chance at completing the mission would be to split up. But if this Kimimaru is as dangerous as Kiba says, then Sasuke would need to be persuaded by force. The massive risk if we were to split up our forces. And that was ignoring the doubt whether completing the mission was even the right thing to do, considering Hinata. Sakura sighs, and thusly, my first mission as a tuning ends in failure. But if she accepted that loss as fact, then what was the point of even fighting anymore? You! She shouted to Kimimaru. We give up. We have no quarrel anymore. Let's just go our separate ways. Unfortunately for them, Kimimaru knew his days were already numbered so engaging in one last fight to serve his master was the way he wanted to go out. So his answer was to draw a bone from his shoulder. You try to get in the way of Lord Orochimaru's dream. That crime needs to be punished, he said, and attacked. With Choji still reeling from the yellow pill, Naruko and Kiba were the best close-range fighters they had left, and they moved to intercept. When Naruko was fighting against Sakon, she felt like he was better at her in Taijutsu, but she was still somewhere around in the same league. Now though, now she almost felt like she was fighting Asuma. She suspected it was only due to Kiba and Naruko attacking from two sides and coordinating their attacks and defenses that they survived the first three seconds. Kiba realized the disparity too and used a smoke bomb to help them disengage. Upon creating some distance, she launched the most powerful cutting great breakthrough she had at her disposal. This also blew the smoke away, so they saw its effects. Some small cuts did appear on his skin, but they hardly seemed to bother him. Sakura saw all this and wondered what to do now. They had actually covered situations like this in the academy, about what to do when your team is being hunted by a clearly superior opponent. Her book suggested that the best thing to do here was for all of them to flee in different directions. If they did that, then it was likely at least some of them would escape. She also knew though, that this also guaranteed that some of them would die. Nobody gets left behind, 
Sakura fought furiously. Sai, you would need support of Nargo and Kiba, she orders, receiving an order from the pale-faced youth. Sakura was in even less of a state to fight in close quarters than usual, but that would hardly make a difference in this case. Her role was range support, as was Sai's. Shikamaru also seemed to understand. It was late in the day, and the shadows were long. Choji logically couldn't do much, as he was still suffering from the after-effects of the yellow pill, but by his expression, he too seemed ready to fight. Just answer me this! Shikamaru yells. What does Orochimaru want with Sasuke? And Kimimaru honestly tells him, causing Shikamaru to angrily turn to Sakura. We shouldn't have given up so quickly! Maybe... Maybe we can still go after them! Sakura could see the near panic in the Nara's eyes. Kimimaru smiles at this. Even if you get past me, by that time it will be too late, and my lord will have obtained the perfect vessel. A little while later at Orochimaru's hideout. Where is S Sasuke? Orochimaru howls. Kabuto again moved his wheelchair to get some painkillers for his master. A new body had already been prepared for Orochimaru in case Sasuke didn't arrive in time, and they could do the ritual any minute now. But Orochimaru still held out hope that Sasuke would arrive in time. If he did, they would immediately ambush and bring him before Orochimaru without delay or explanation. Orochimaru really didn't feel like waiting another three years to be able to use the Sharingan. But there was only so long they could wait. A few more minutes and Orochimaru would risk dying for real if he didn't switch to another body. Hurry, Sasuke! Orochimaru screamed. Meanwhile, at the Valley of the End. Hinata was both confused and worried. The source of her confusion was Sasuke. He had run from the pursuit team, but after a while, he had just kind of... Uh, stopped. He didn't stand still, but he just kind of... Uh, meandered his way forward. Hardly any faster than your average civilian. And now here they were, at the Valley of the End, and Sasuke just paused to take in the scenery, and even give her a lesson on this place's historical significance. Sasuke, I mean, all of this is very interesting and all, but don't we have places to be? Do you remember what that new guy said to me? That he was going to kill all of our friends like vermin? He not that grimaced. No, before that. He said, you must hurry, our master is running out of time. What do you think that means? I... I'm not sure, Hinata admitted. Neither am I, however, I'm really not interested in what I can do for Orochimaru, or what he can get from me. All that matters is what I can get from him. I can't exactly put my finger on it, but my instincts tell me it's better if I just take my time here. If that angers Orochimaru, then so be it. I refuse to be afraid of him. He's a lot braver than I am, Hinata thought. She could admit to herself that Orochimaru terrified her. Anyway, let's move on, shall we? Be careful of the water. The waterfall would make it flow fast and thus harder to stand on. And he jumped down from Hashirama's head to walk across the water. Again, Sasuke seemed to be taking his sweet time. Hinata, though? She found her steps going slower than even Sasuke's. Her Byakugan had a long range by now, but there was still a limit. And just a little farther, and she'd be unable to follow the fighting against Orochimaru's last henchman. She had been observing the fighting this entire time, and it hadn't been going well for the Leaf team. This new foe was unlike anything they had ever faced before. This was, in fact, the source of her worry, next to the earlier confusion which has now been explained. Is this really alright? Hinata thought. She was free. She had gotten away from her family's clutches. It was what she had wanted, wasn't it? Hinata had, earlier in the day, rejected receiving the upgraded curse mark. Because the feelings that had been with her ever since she had defeated Sakura in the tuning exams were still with her. She feared what she was becoming. For most of her life, she had been considered a failure. Her clan had at one point called her... too kind. It was meant as an insult, yet deep down, Hinata had been pleased by it. She was weak, she was a failure, but at least she was still good. 
Even in her darkest moments, nobody had ever been able to take it from her. But then, it had been taken from her. By Orochimaru, or by Hinata herself, depending on how one viewed the curse marks corruption. Sasuke had tried to assure her that she shouldn't feel guilty about anything that had happened. Sakura had been an accident, and that she deserved it. But any such assurances, that she wasn't to blame for anything that had happened, felt hollow right now. For here she was, running to safety, while her friends with one exception were all likely going to die. They had come to save her. Granted, their saving was more of a danger to her than if they had just done nothing, yet the thought remained. They had come because they cared, and Hinata was walking away from them in their hour of greatest need. When she had begun her journey, what had been the goal? To be stronger? She had obtained strength with the curse mark, and it had been offered even more, and it hadn't made her happy. To be useful? She was useful. Her team had eventually been able to convince her of that, yet it hadn't been enough. To not be considered a failure? By now, even if she gained her family's respect, would she even respect them in turn? She no longer cared about their approval. Hinata sped up her pace and ran past Sasuke stopped in front of him and spread her arms wide. In the end, what Hinata truly wished, what she had been struggling for, at its most base level, it was so she could just stop hating herself. Hinata, what's the meaning of this? Sasuke said with a clear warning in his voice. We have to go back, she said. Sasuke's eyes widened suddenly, but then he shrugged. Well, I never wanted you to come along in the first place, remember? If you want to go back, go right ahead. Sasuke tried to step past her, but Hinata moved to keep standing in his way. Our friends are dying! I don't see how that's my problem. Just swallow that pill, and when next you open your eyes, you'll be a changed man. Please don't let it be so, Hinata prayed. They are in danger because they wanted to save us. Well, we never asked for that. I don't see why you or I are in any way responsible here. It's not about responsibility, it's about our friends needing us. I have more important things on my mind than friendship. Again, Sasuke tried to step around her, and again, Hinata blocked his path. Sasuke's eyes narrowed. Hinata? Are you... Are you getting in the way of my goal? Something about the way he said that, and the look in his eyes. Hinata found it even more terrifying than when he explained how he needed to kill her to evolve his Sharingan. No! I just don't want you to lose yourself in pursuit of it! A small price to pay. Now step aside! And when she didn't, he raised a hand towards her, and Hinata could sense the hostile intent. She caved instantly. She stepped back and held up her hands in surrender. All right, she said, and felt her heart shatter in pieces. All right, I don't stand a chance against you. You, you go do what you must, and I'll, I'll go do the same. And she started to run back. Sasuke watched Hinata run away from him with a befuddled expression, as if unsure of what had just happened. Sasuke's default response to being challenged was to fight. Two ninjas brutally beating the shit out of each other to see who was right, as it was meant to be. But no challenge was coming, and so Sasuke was alone with his thoughts. He looked down, placed a hand on his neck, and the curse mark at last fully receded, though Sasuke could still feel its power coursing through him. When he looked back up, Hinata was already out of sight. Sasuke looked past the statue of Hashirama Senju, past where the people he had known all his life were, according to Hinata, in the fight of their lives. A fight which again, according to Hinata, they were losing. Then, Sasuke turned around and looked past the statue of Madara Uchiha, where his destiny lay. Sasuke's face contracted as if he was in pain. Such fools, he whispered. Sakura knew that there was a certain difference in skill, whereupon numbers no longer mattered. A point where no matter how many ninjas of lower skill you put against a ninja of higher skill, 
Those of lower skill lack the ability to so much as inconvenience the other. Fodder, basically. Sakura thought that they weren't quite fat to Kimimaru, but damn if it wasn't close. Only through a combination of Sakura's genjutsu, Shikamaru's shadow possession, and a horde of inky insects buzzing around and trying to fly into Kimimaru's eyes, were Nariko and Kiba able to survive in melee with the enemy. And even then they were at a clear disadvantage. Sakura's genjutsu barely seemed to last long enough for everyone to blink before Kimimaru broke it. Shikamaru's shadow possession wasn't strong enough to even hold him for a second, so all he could do was to try and slow him down a little. And it wasn't like Shikamaru and Sakura could just stay still. Since they were so obviously less suited to close quarters, they were equally obvious targets for Kimimaru. To that end, Narakot left a clone with each of them whose sole job was to help them flee, or as an emergency distraction for the support to escape. Choji wasn't fast enough to compete with Kimimaru in melee, but his human boulder was. Barely. He routinely came charging in out of nowhere to tackle against Kimimaru. All it did was to briefly knock the bone user off balance, or cause a moment's distraction, while Choji received a myriad of cuts in turn. Kiba had successfully hit him with his two-headed wolf fang over fang, the same jutsu that had all but one shot at Tayuya. It had sent Kimimaru flying and it had cracked the bone he had been using as a sword. Kimimaru landed on his hand, did a backflip and then threw the broken bone away and just pulled a new one out of his body. And that was a jutsu that Kiba could only perform twice a day, which he now had. Somewhere along the way, Naruko had figured out how to use the Rasengan by herself using her shadow clones and with a lot of help from the support team had managed to tag Kimimaru with it once. This too had sent him flying and even shredded the part of his skin. When he had gotten back up, they had found that under his shredded skin there was pure bone, which only had a few cracks. That and Kiba's earlier stunt had convinced Kimimaru to start using his stage 1 curse mark, and it was somehow even further downhill from there. After that, Kimimaru had made sure to always destroy Nariko's shadow clones before they could perform the Rasengan by shooting them with his knuckle bones. Needless to say, any regular punch or kick by either Kiba or Nariko went outright ignored. Kiba and Akamaru's regular fang or fang at least still warranted enough respect to be worth dodging or parrying. The same was true for any wind nature enhanced slashes Nariko tried with her kunai. The injuries Kiba and Nariko started to sustain also increased as Kimimaru was capable of just growing new spiky bones out of his body, for both offensive and defensive purposes. The worst part of it was that all of them were by now familiar enough with how this worked to know that Kimimaru could up the ante even more with a second stage transformation if he ever felt the need to. Shikamaru, you're supposed to be the smartest guy ever, right? Sakura said. This would be a wonderful time to prove it. I'm working on it, Shikamaru said. He was sitting down and had his fingers pressed together in what we all know as his strategizing pose. Sakura, if given a chance to work on someone's mind unimpeded, could you control them? I don't know, I haven't ever tried it before. I usually just trick someone's senses for a few seconds, but, but what do you have in mind? Sakura asked and Shikamaru shared his plan. I'm not sure I can do that, but we're well past the point of safe plans. Sai! Could you increase the pressure for a while to give me some time? I can give you a minute, but then I'll be out of chakra. And next, a small army of inky animals assaulted Kimimaru. Sai was drawing them so fast, his pale skin was starting to look black from the ink stains which flew from his pen. Naruko and Kiba also used his brief reprieve to catch their breath. Kimimaro, it should be noted, wasn't even breathing hard. After the inky beasts were destroyed, Kimimaro looked and found that the leaf team had pulled Jirobo out of Sai's scroll. Sakura had climbed onto his shoulder and put her hands on his forehead. With the drugs that Sai had administered earlier, his mind was substantially weaker, which allowed Sakura to use her genjutsu skills to give very basic instructions to him. What good will that buffoon do you? Even if you could control him perfectly, I routinely prove my superiority against all of my subordinates at the same time, and you believe the weakest of them will make a difference. If Sakura just tried to pilot Jiroba as a combatant, that would have indeed been embarrassingly ineffective. 
Jirobo, in his drugged state, had none of his instincts for battle, none of his ninjutsu, and nothing except the most basic of instructions that Sakura gave him. Even instructing him to enter his second stage curse mark had been difficult, and Sakura had been glad she managed that much. Thankfully, they had something else up their sleeve. Choji, no! Shikamaru yells, and Choji hurled the red chili pill at Sakura, who caught it and immediately shoved it into Jirobo's mouth. Chakra exploded from Jirobo, as his already monstrous second stage curse mark strength was multiplied a hundredfold. Sakura gave one simple instruction to him before jumping away. Jirobo shot forward while shouting the command Sakura had given him. Jirobo SMASH! Kimimaru's eyes widened in panic before Jirobo hit him like a missile, and the ground beneath their feet exploded from the impact. All of the leaf ninjas struggled to hold their balance as the whole forest trembled from the forces Jirobo was unleashing upon Kimimaru. When the tremor stopped, the whole battlefield was covered by a cloud of dust, and a huge crater nearly 20 yards in diameter had been created in the middle. When the dust settled, nothing remained of Jirobo except the husk of a corpse. As he was not an Akamichi who had been acclimated to the pills, the side effects were even more severe and immediate. As for Kimimaru... Ah, crap. Kiba said what they were all thinking. Kimimaru was in a second stage curse mark form. Surrounding him were shards of bone. Cranial bone to be exact. The hardest Kimimaru had at his disposal. He had to eject it from his head as a shield, and even then he had to recreate it several times, since Jirobo's attacks shattered even his strongest bone with a few hits. Kimimaru was the strongest of Orochimaru's current subordinates, would have been Orochimaru's preferred vessel, even over a wielder of the Sharingan. He had aided in the assassination of Akage. He was easily joining level, and probably towards the high end of it tier, and his single strongest attribute was durability. Yet even with all that, and having fallen back in full defense, Jirobo's attacks had nearly been the end of him, and he clearly hadn't come out of it unscathed, yet come out of it he had. A bloody Kinumaru shakily climbed to his feet and looked ready to continue the fight. Any other ideas like that? Sakura asked. No. That second form must have some drawbacks or limits, otherwise they would have all just started with that. But beyond that I've got nothing. Kimimaru jumped forward, towards Sakura and Shikamaru. Two of Nariko's clones raised their long hair, which they had hidden in the grass, and used it as a sort of lasso around Kimimaru. The bone user ignored this and just kept charging forward. The real Nariko, having prepared for the worst, was already interposed between Kimimaru and Sakura. She raised a hand full of spinning chakra behind her, and Sakura got the hint. Together they created the BFF Rasengan, and unlike Sakon, Kimimaru seemed willing to test it. His palm shot forward, and out of it a thick piece of bone appeared like a spear, impacting the Rasengan. It was immediately obvious to both Nariko and Sakura that a regular Rasengan that Nariko could now make by herself wouldn't have held out against this force. The Nariko clones, meanwhile, had been pulled along by Kimimaru. But now that the momentum had stopped, they created even more clones themselves, which all threw their hair around Kimimaru, until he was almost completely covered in gold locks. All the clones pulled, relieving some of the pressure of Sakura and the real Nariko. With that bit of extra help, the force of the Rasengan began to win out, and Kimimaru was lifted off his feet and sent flying again. The clones still made sure to keep their hair around him, and Nariko created even more clones to add even more bindings on Kimimaru treating him as if he was some kind of monstrous beast that they had to restrain. After this day, Nariko, just like Canon Naruto, would realize that she could make a lot more clones than what was considered normal. She tried to infuse her hair with Wind Chakra, but was unable to cut Kidomaru in any meaningful fashion. The clones also weren't strong enough to immobilize him completely, but they did seem to restrict his movements. With those restrictions, Kiba felt now was the time to see if his fang over fang still did anything. Kimimaro, with a surge of strength that the clones could do nothing against, slapped Kiba away with his new tail. 
Akiba was sent flying and slammed against a rock, and it was clear he wouldn't be rejoining the fight anytime soon. By time, Shikamaru suggested, and repeated his theory that the second stage must have a limit. None of them knew of Kimimaro's illness, so stalling was actually a better plan than any of them realized. Easier said than done, Nariko said. Kimimaro bulldozed forward and the clones could do nothing as they were pulled along, and the real Nariko couldn't avoid getting into melee. As Nariko was less used to incorporating clones into her fighting style, she's not as good at disguising who the real one is compared to Ken and Naruto. Hence why Kimimaro could single her out. Thankfully, Kimimaro's speed hadn't been increased as much as his strength and durability had been, so she could still dodge, though parrying was out of the question. Nariko no longer even bothered to try to counterattack. If that stunt with Jirobu didn't kill him, then nothing she had at her disposal could do the job. It was a testament to how desperate that they all were that none of them even questioned it when Hinata jumped into the clearing and immediately joined Nariko in her close quarters combat with Kimimaro. It didn't matter that Hinata was partially responsible that they were in this mess. All that mattered was that they were stuck in the hardest fight of their lives and Hinata was being helpful. Hinata's skin was covered in the markings of the cursed mark. She hated using it, but she felt the damage to her soul would be worse if she didn't use it in this case. Besides, without the speed boost that it provided, she wouldn't have been able to survive for long. Even with the clones trying to restrict Himimaro's movements, and even with Sakura still distracting him with Genjutsu, he was still a lot faster than she would have been in her base form. The sun had by now completely set, so Shikamaru was now a non-factor. He threw his remaining smoke bombs whenever it seemed that Nariko or Hinata needed a quick escape, but that was all he could do. The same was true for Sai and Choji, and within a few minutes, for Sakura as well. Her chakra was running out. All except for Nariko had already taken a second soldier pill that day, when the fight against Kimimaro began. Taking more than one a day could be hazardous to their health, but there were bigger and more immediate threats to their health to worry about right now. Though on the upside, Hinata's presence now meant that they once again had a means of injuring Kimimaro, as the gentle fist bypassed almost all forms of durability, and she struck at him several times. You think I care about any damage to my internal organs? Kimimaro smiled, and blood flew from between his lips. My body was already ruined beyond repair when this fight began. He pulled at the hair trying to restrict him, and a clutch of clones was sent flying towards him, and Kimimaro easily tore them apart. He then began repeating this maneuver. Nariko summoned more clones to replace the ones she lost, but even her stamina had its limits, and she was reaching hers. Hinata tried to take advantage of Kimimaro being busy with something that wasn't her, and go on the offensive. She got one more strike off before Kimimaro turned and sent Hinata flying with his tail. And just like Kiba, that one hit was enough to take her out of the fight. Not that she'd have been able to keep fighting like this for long anyway. Her Great One curse mark ate away at her chakra, and she didn't have nearly as much of that as Sasuke, so the time for which she could use it was a lot shorter. The clones, as they were pulled to their doom, made Rasengan to bombard Kimimaro with as a last act of defiance. And some of those did hit, and stagger him, but it just wasn't enough. Then it was just Nariko, as the last combatant who could do anything. There were no more clones, and to make more would bring her own reserves dangerously low. Sakura and Sai were out of chakra. All of them were low on ninja tools. Nariko tried to continue dodging, but within seconds, Kimimaro had a hand around her neck and lifted her into the air. I know you, he said. You got in the way of Lord Orochimaru's will when he went to retrieve the Slug Princess. He narrowed his eyes. I will now administer just punishment for that sin. Nariko had immediately brought her chin to her chest to make it harder to squeeze her throat, but she knew it was a paltry defense. In this position, all he needed to do was squeeze and crush her windpipe and she was dead. Her only saving grace, if you could even call it that, was that Kimimaro seemed to want to draw out her suffering. Sakura rushed forward in a pointless attempt to help, but she was sent flying to join Kiba and Hinata, and now had a broken arm for her efforts. Nariko tried to pry the hand loose, but the grip was unshakable. Nariko's face was turning blue due to the lack of oxygen. My friends will be next, Nariko thought. In desperation, she tried to reach for the QB's chakra. 
What is it now? She heard the fox's voice. I'm dying, she thought. So you are. When you meet Kashina in the Pure Land, give her my regards. Nadako's hands fell limp to her sides, and her vision began to darken. She heard the voice of her friends, Sakara calling her name. And... And something that sounded like a thousand birds chirping. The pressure around her neck fell away, and she fell on the ground. Lifting her face from the grass, Nadako saw a blue shirt with a white and red fan. Just what do you think you're doing to my friends? Kimimaro stumbled backwards and stared in horrified disbelief. No, you can't be here. The hand he had used to hold Nariko had been cut clean off. Sasuke Uchiha charged forward, a free Tomoe Sharingan blazing in his eyes. His base Sharingan had fully evolved the moment he had turned his back to the statue of Madara Uchiha and started running. You are supposed to fulfill Lord Rajimaru's dream? I care nothing for that snake's dream. I have a use for your master, that is all. Sasuke said as he entered first stage curse mark and let his hand glow with lightning. He jabbed forward and drew blood from Kimimaro. The lightning didn't dissipate from Sasuke's hands as he kept using it to increase the potency of his base attacks. You! You! Kimimaro didn't seem able to find a curse or insult strong enough and simply howled in rage and despair before going on the offensive. With his fully evolved Sharingan, Sasuke predicted Kimimaro's movements and dodged with more grace than he ever had before. His eyes allowed him to see where bones were going to spring from his body through the buildup of chakra. Ignoring all injuries to himself, Kimimaro rushed at Sasuke. His large horns prevented Sasuke from dodging to the side. Sasuke jumped over the attack instead and used Kimimaro's own body as a springboard to jump into the air. He weaved hand signs and then bathed Kimimaro in flame. Out of the flame, a now singed Kimimaro appeared. The hand which Sasuke had severed now resembled a giant drill, and in his upper hand he held his own spine which he used as a whip to try and swipe Sasuke out of the air. Nanako next reminded everyone that she was still a factor in this battle by pulling Sasuke out of the way of the attack with her hair. VILE PESTS! Kimimaro charged at Nanako who jumped into the air. She blasted herself higher and higher with her winjutsu, and Sasuke, still stuck to her hair, was also sent flying. Nariko whirled Sasuke around and around in the sky, building up momentum, until she hurled him at Kimimaro. Sasuke already had his Chidori prepared. Kimimaro met the challenge head-on, and his giant drill of bone as well as the arm it was attached to severed in two. He's... he's too dangerous, my lord. I must destroy him. Again he howled and began to look even more monstrous. There was no skin on him anymore, just a pure white skeleton of sharp bone, and he charged. Sasuke entered his second stage curse mark. Firestyle, Dragon Flame Jutsu! Kimimaro, knowing that one way or another his life was over after this attack, ignored the pain of being burned alive and struggled forward against the heat and the pressure. He had to remove this threat to his master. Nariko next landed next to Sasuke and gathered whatever chakra she had left. Windstyle Great Breakthrough! In what felt like a lifetime ago, back when her biggest concern in life had been flirting with the boy next to her, she had once claimed that her wind jutsus could strengthen his fire jutsus. Today, she proved it, as Sasuke's flames increased in intensity to the point where everyone else had to shield their eyes due to the blinding light. Both Sasuke and Nariko kept their respective techniques on for as long as they were able, and when they stopped, they found what remained of Kimimaro standing just a few yards away from them. A skeleton that most resembled a small dinosaur. His bones were blackened but otherwise whole, Kimimaro's insides, however, had melted or evaporated until there was nothing left of him but the skeleton. Nariko wobbled on her feet and then fell on her ass, completely exhausted. Sasuke let the curse mark recede and also breathed heavily from the short but intense bit of combat. He walked over to where Hinata had fallen. Hinata looked at him through misty eyes, and though she looked bruised and battered, Sasuke didn't think he'd ever seen her this happy. He helped her upright and landed her his shoulder. Then Sasuke and Hinata looked at everyone else, and an awkward silence descended upon them. Nariko was the first to break it. So... does this mean you're coming back with us? Sasuke snorted. Don't be foolish. I still have a goal that's more important than anything. And Orochimaru is my best hope of achieving it. 
It's just that coming back to save you bunch of losers didn't really cost me anything. And this was a great opportunity to flex my new abilities. Hinata rolled her eyes. Okay, so what he is trying and failing to say is that he really cares about all of you, which is why he came back. However, he still has his own choices to make. Choices that you cannot make for him. Choked laughter came from Kiba. It clearly hurt him to do so, considering his injuries, but he seemingly couldn't help himself. Is something funny, Mutt? Sasuke demanded. <laughs> I can't believe I never realized it before. Kiba pointed an accusing finger at Sasuke. You're a Tsundere! Sasuke gaped at him before trying to cloak himself into an air of dignity. I am not. He kind of is, Hinata said. Again Sasuke gaped and he looked at Hinata with a betrayed expression. She just smiled back at him. This was too much and everyone except for Sai couldn't help but laugh or chuckle at Sasuke's expense. Sasuke threw up his hands in disgust. If they were trying to convince him that coming back was the right choice, Sasuke thought they were doing a piss poor job of it. As for Sai... Wait, he said. Don't we still have a mission? Sakura, who was leaning against the tree, snorted before pointing at Sasuke with her one good arm. If you want to try and stop them, go right on ahead. I'm done fighting for the day. They had all seen Sasuke move, and they doubted he could beat him now, even if they weren't all completely spent from the last fight. Not that any of them even felt like stopping them after he came back to save their asses. Chikamaru, who was out of chakra but physically okay, stepped forward towards his Genin teammates. Sasuke looked at Chikamaru and looked almost afraid. Please. Please don't tell me you're going to insist on coming along as well. You wish, Shikamaru said, smiling despite himself before getting serious. You know Orochimaru is going to eventually turn you into his new vessel, right? Maybe. Regardless, it is my life to risk. Shikamaru thought about that, decided that he didn't like it, and then realized that there was jack all he could do about it. Jeez. Shikamaru rubbed his head. I knew the two of you were going to make my life difficult ever since day one, but I never imagined this. I didn't mean to, Sasuke said. I don't regret my decision, but you deserve better than two traitors. Traitors? What are you even talking about? Sasuke, Hinata, wherever you may go, whatever causes you might claim or deny, you two will always be my comrades. Yep, Kiba said, with an agreeable woof from Akamaru. Agreed. If anything, all of this just adds to your delicious bad boy vibes, Naruko said with a grin. You came back for us, Sakura said. It was nice to know her crush on Sasuke had been completely misplaced. Yeah man, totally. Choji said while making a peace sign with his hands. Still comrades. No, they're not, Sai said. He looked more confused than upset. Choji looked at Sasuke while pointing at Sai. He's not with us. Yeah, he was just kind of forcing us, Sakura said. We don't really know the guy. Sai suddenly felt a stab of... something in his chest. Something unpleasant. What a peculiar emotion. Naruko saw this and decided she was going to have to explain the concept of friendship to him on the way back. Sasuke couldn't completely suppress his smile. I suppose there are worse things. He turned around and began walking away. Hinata, after exchanging a swift hug with Shikamaru, followed after him. Sasuke! Naruko called out. Sasuke stopped but didn't turn around. But whatever it's worth, I hope you succeed in killing Itachi. He is my enemy too. Sasuke still didn't turn around, but he did give her a thumbs up, and then he and Hinata kept walking until they were out of sight. A little past the valley of the end, Hinata noticed something odd in the sky. 
People saw all sorts of strange patterns in the clouds. But just for a moment, she thought she could see the clouds spell out the words Thank you. She blinked and then it was gone. It was so odd that Hinata disrupted her own chakra network just to make sure she wasn't under some sort of genjutsu. Little did she know, she had indeed been under a sort of genjutsu. But by the time she disrupted her own chakra network, it already dissipated itself a second earlier. And one of the genjutsu's purposes was to keep her from noticing a certain someone with her Pyakugan. A little while later, close to the border between the lands of sound and the lands of hot water. Kisami stretched lazily on the rock he had been sitting on, having just come out of one of Akatsuki's regular meetings through astral projection. Nothing of importance had been discussed. It was just a regular status update. Confirming plans for the future, sharing opportunities to gather money, interesting gossip, that sort of stuff. These meetings weren't mandatory unless otherwise specified. Itachi hadn't shown up for the meeting, and honestly, Kisami didn't blame the man. Ever since he had been taken down by a bunch of genin, Deidara had decided that at least one in every five sentences he spoke would be used to remind Itachi of this fact. And though he was the worst of the lot, Deidara wasn't the only one. All who didn't know him well now wondering whether Itachi was really all that. So no, Kisami didn't blame him for not wanting to spend more time around him than he had to. Kisame had, in fact, not seen Itachi for a couple of days. This wasn't that unusual. When the Akatsuki summoned you via their rings, everyone was supposed to show up, no questions asked. But outside of that, its members were allowed to pursue their own goals and hobbies. Though Itachi had been acting a bit weird ever since the news of Konoha's newly chosen fifth Okage had reached them, and he had left shortly afterwards. Kisame had, of course, informed both Pain and the Masked Man of this but neither thought this worthy of note. I hope all is well. Kisame nearly jumped in surprise. Really, that Itachi could casually sneak up on someone like him should be proof enough about how good he was. Besides being bored and... Kisame paused as he got a good look at his partner. Is something the matter? No. Itachi sat and lay down on the grass, his arms held behind his head and resting against a small rock. No seriously dude, what the hell? Kisame said. Itachi didn't respond. He looked like nothing Kisame had ever seen him before. The ever serious and stoic Itachi Uchiha was smiling and watching the landscape illuminated by moonlight. Looking as for the first time in forever, he had decided that all was right in the world. And that's where we end part 28, and what is for all intents and purposes the finale of part 1 of Naruto. Next time, we'll have a much, much shorter chapter where we wrap up part 1. But just to wrap this arc up, let's quickly mention the hypothetical fight that most of you were expecting, Naruto vs Sasuke. <clears throat> Naruto would have gotten destroyed. While I think your base is stronger than canon Naruto, she doesn't have anything except her base. The QB wouldn't have lifted a finger to help her, and without that, she just isn't competing with Valeria and Sasuke. Also, I just wanted an excuse to display this bit of fan art. So yeah, Nike's out.